Uh, welcome everyone to uh, this panel uh, where we're going to have two very interesting papers presented on uh, sanctions and uh, uh, human rights, uh, particularly as it pertains to corporations. Um, we, each of the speakers uh, will present their papers for 15 minutes each, and then uh, I will ask uh, a few questions, and then we will uh, open this to questions from you, uh, the, the, the audience. Uh, we're gonna start with uh, Maria Askanova. Uh, Marina is um, assistant professor at IE Law School in Madrid and a lawyer specializing in international and comparative criminal law. Um, she has several degrees. Uh, her, her first degree is uh, with honors in law from International University in Moscow. She holds an LLM in public international law from Amsterdam, an MSc from Oxford, and defended her PhD at the European Uni University Institute in Florence. Uh, in addition to uh, uh, doing international comparative criminal law broadly, uh, Marina uh, has interests that lie in the intersection of international criminal justice and aesthetics and coordinates the Art and International Justice Initiative uh, uh, with the purpose of bringing more awareness to experiment experiential dimension of international justice. She has worked in Copenhagen. Uh, she has worked at the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia and Phnom Penh. She worked for White and Case in Moscow. She's worked for the ICTY in The Hague, and she's won numerous awards, including, and I want to emphasize this one for a personal reason, the EUI annual Mauro Capaletti Prize for the best thesis in comparative law. I emphasize that because Mauro Capaletti taught me, uh, uh, well, I, I took a seminar with him many years ago at Stanford uh, on justice. And, and I, I will add that he, he started every, we would have, we would sit around a table and he started every single class. He'd order us all a cappuccino and he'd start, and there were like 12 of us around the table. He'd start every single question, every single class, he would take a sip of his cappuccino, he'd put it down and he'd say, what is justice? But uh, anyway, with that, uh, Marina. It's a pleasure to be here for many, many reasons. And it's very inspiring. I must say that it is by pure chance that I'm participating in a conference on business and human rights, because indeed my interests lie a little bit outside of this domain in general. I specialize in international criminal law and I've been pulled towards aesthetics. But there are two people who are also part of this conference who influenced me in a sense of thinking more about corporate complicity. And these two people are um, uh, Miriam Sagemas, who spoke yesterday, and she's from uh, the European Center for um, Constitutional Human Rights, a Berlin-based NGO, and Beth Van Schack, who invited me to participate a little bit in the Amiki brief um, uh, for the Nestle case. So these two people really deserve credit, and a lot of points I will make are the result of my work on uh, these two cases. So I specialize on complicity, complicity in international criminal law. And the reason I was asked to help with uh, firstly the case of potential complicity of European arms trade companies supplying weapons to Saudi Arabia coalition. And with these weapons, as some of you may know, uh, some crimes are committed in Yemen. Uh, and then the second case is of course the Nestle case, which has been discussed quite extensively yesterday which deals with potential responsibility of uh, Nestle and other companies um, engaged in, uh, in certain activities outside of the United States, which involve uh, child slavery and child labor. So the reason I was asked to look at these cases is precisely because of my speciali specialization in complicity. Um, so, as we talked yesterday, there are many tools for holding corporations responsible. And we can look at international criminal law. And in my short presentation, I will try to convince you perhaps that international criminal law can be a source of inspiration, one of the tools in the toolbox of increasing corporate accountability. 
And um, it can also be a more precise remedy mechanism as the uh, European Center for Constitutional uh, and Human Rights is trying to prove by filing a communication to the ICC, to the International Criminal Court, to hold corporate officials located in Europe responsible for supplying weapons to, Yem uh, to Saudi Arabia, knowing that crimes are committed with these weapons. So two aspects, a more general inspiration framework and then more specific ICC as a remedy mechanism. So um, before I go into the specifics of the international criminal law framework, I want to make two disclaimers. One is that international criminal law, as it stands now, does not permit corporate responsibility. So responsibility of legal entities as such. It only targets uh, individuals. Uh, there have been some attempts to hold organizations responsible at the early uh, stages of the development of international criminal law uh, post-World War II, Nuremberg jurisprudence. However, um, the trajectory of international criminal law is such that for now we only have individual criminal responsibility. This is one disclaimer. So uh, the second uh, disclaimer I want to make is that up until this moment, international criminal law has not really been used uh, extensively to hold corporate officials accountable. There are many reasons for that. Of course, there are political reasons, which we will not go into right now. Um, and also, I would argue that the power dynamics are such that international criminal law tries to target those most responsible. So up until recently, those most responsible in the framework of international criminal law would be military commanders and uh, political civil leadership. However, as we know, now the dynamics are changing and corporations hold increased power. Um, so that would be uh, reasonable to consider that international criminal law framework should and would apply to corporate officials going forward. Perhaps I'm a bit idealistic in my thinking, but in terms of logical uh, purposes of international criminal law, it only seems reasonable to assume that. So that being said, um, I want to focus on one particular mode of responsibility that is enshrined in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Why, why I focus on um, international criminal law framework is because it does provide us with very detailed definitions of complicity and different modalities of complicity. So we can hold people responsible for ordering crimes, for also assisting uh, criminality um, in a group form. But the one I want to focus specifically on is the one which um, provides for responsibility of those who, for the, um, for the purpose of committing, uh, for the purpose of uh, facilitating a crime, assist or contribute to the commission of this crime. So it's 25 c of the Rome Statute for those of you who want to follow with the text of the statute. Uh, this is one of the most common definitions of complicity and it's also found in many domestic jurisdictions. So that provides us a good link also to domestic law in that sense. And I would argue in general that this provision facilitating uh, the commission of the crime would be applicable to the actions of corporate officials. And I mentioned two cases when I started, the ones I helped with, and I would say in both cases, we could theoretically apply the framework developed by the International Criminal Court. Uh, however, I wanted to point out three problems or three challenges in applying this mode of responsibility to the actions of corporate officials in a way it will be a sui generis type of responsibility if we talk about corporate officials. So why is that? And three reasons. Two of them have to do with mens rea, so the fault requirement, and one deals with actus reas. When we talk about uh, culpable assistance, we talk about facilitating for the purpose of commission of a crime. So what does it mean uh, to uh, speak about the purpose in assistance? It's quite a 
it's quite a tricky requirement and it's quite new because it has not been used uh, in the jurisprudence of the ad hoc tribunals that only used knowledge. So you would assist with knowledge, uh, but not necessarily with purpose. The requirement of purpose comes actually from the middle model penal code adopted in the US and it's an enhanced mental state requirement. One can say that what is required is intent to contribute. It does not uh, mean that we require that, for instance, uh, arms suppliers share the intent of those who bomb civilians in Yemen. This is not required. What is required is that they provide assistance with intent. So there are two elements. Uh, one is providing assistance with intent and the other one is knowing that certain crimes are committed. So when we speak about knowledge, we speak about specificity of crimes committed in Yemen. So it is important that um, suppliers of weapons, for example, know what's going on in general in Yemen, and they know that their um, weapons may be used to commit one of a certain range of crimes. So this is the knowledge part. However, when we talk about the intent to contribute or purpose to contribute, it becomes more tricky. And I would say it's going to be one of the main challenges for the ICC when interpreting the communication with respect to arms suppliers. And going forward, it will be a more general problem because companies usually seek profit. They don't have this direct purpose to contribute to crimes necessarily. Rather, their um, goal is to extract profit, and this is their motivation. And in criminal law, we usually say, well, motive is irrelevant. I would argue that in this specific case, motive is actually relevant in terms of its factual component. So um, what do I mean by that? By showing that companies consistently, as in a pattern of certain conduct, consistently continue to supply um, aid to their subcontractors, as in Nestle, providing uh, certain financial assistance to some subcontractors in a consistent manner to extract profit, we can also show this purpose to contribute. So motive and purpose become interlinked here, and in a way this um, distinction fades when we speak about corporate uh, facilitation. This is my claim, and it clearly needs to be developed further, but I would say it's one of the ways to reach this uh, high threshold of purpose. So this is uh, one big challenge for holding corporate officials accountable to show that they contribute with a purpose. The second big problem um, for establishing mens rea or fault requirement for corporate officials is the existence of prior state approvals. So usually when international trade occurs, uh, it occurs in the light of uh, certain um, conditions met by the company and it involves state uh, authorizations, approvals, state assent in some form. So what is the consequence of that? The consequence of that is that corporations could invoke this authorization as a defense, saying, well, we are not really culpable because what we do is uh, in accordance with what the government allowed us to do. This is a big obstacle, of course, and this links um, to the keynote address yesterday that mentioned, in fact, uh, the importance of due diligence obligations both for states but also for companies and at this point we don't really have mandatory due diligence framework for companies yes we have the guiding principles and i'm sure your name will talk more about the guiding principles so i will not cover that here but there is certain responsibility incumbent on companies to conduct due diligence but it's not really strictly enforced and uh, the companies can always defer to the state and the states are obliged in some instances to conduct their own due diligence. For example, when we talk about um, arms trade, uh, under the arms trade treaty, uh, for instance, the states are obliged to uh, deny uh, authorizations in cases when there is a risk of committing war crimes or human rights violations. So they're obliged to do that, but then states would say, Actually, it's a very broad issue. We don't know the specifics uh, and authorizations are usually given for a certain period of time, like a year or two years for a number of companies, for a number of purposes. So my argument would be that this kind of approval 
uh, does not preclude the obligation for each specific company under each specific uh, supply to conduct its own due diligence uh, assessment. So these two processes should be independent and should be treated as independent. That would be my um, response to this challenge. And then the third challenge um, to holding corporate officials accountable under the framework of international criminal law would relate to the conduct element of uh, of this form of liability that is complicity. Usually what happens is that assistance uh, is of mixed nature. So the supplies are going to, to the country, the supplies are going somewhere, and most of them are used for legitimate aims. That is to build infrastructure in Africa, for, for example, or um, in cases of foreign supplies, this could be in enhancing state security of uh, Saudi Arabia. So that would be the legitimate aim. And the companies may argue, well, mostly our uh, assistance goes towards that. And if um, the state in question decides to use it for other purposes, it's not our problem because the primary um, direction of our aid is towards legitimate purposes. So um, this, is, this also links to the question of remoteness of assistance. And I believe this is one of the biggest problems in the Nestle case, because the link between what happened in the US and what happened in um, cocoa plantations uh, is quite weak. So there, is, uh, there are lots of intermediaries in between. So this actually goes to the heart of this conduct requirement. The Yugoslavia tribunal looked at this problem specifically uh, in one of the cases uh, when the aid was very remote from the ultimate harm, from the ultimate result. The case is Parishage for those who might be interested to look at it. And ultimately, uh, the Yugoslavia tribunal rejected the requirement of specific direction of aid in later jurisprudence. So in this one case, yes, they said the aid needs exactly needs to be specifically directed to harm, uh, to a crime. Uh, and this case is an exception, but later the court corrected itself and said, no, in fact, there is no such requirement that the aid needs or facilitation or whatever um, help or assistance is given. It needs to be directly uh, um, targeting the crime. It can be of mixed nature. It just needs to have some effect on the crime. And I would say that the International Criminal Court still has to elaborate on this uh, more, but the little indicators that we have so far from uh, the case called Bemba et al. Uh, is that, in fact, indeed, the International Criminal Court does not adopt this specific direction requirement. So it allows for this mixed nature of uh, conduct, mixed nature of assistance. Moreover, last point, uh, because of the enhanced mens rea or fault requirement that is uh, to assist with a purpose, one can say that the conduct requirement is lessened to some uh, extent. So there is a balancing act always for the courts. And this is also the case law under the model penal code in the US because of the enhanced mental state requirement. So the emphasis on subjectivity, um, the conduct requirement is not so stringent. So that makes sense because otherwise uh, too many people either would be caught in the net or left out of the net. So the law has to balance that. So um, to sum up, I would say that the International uh, Criminal Court and International Criminal Law provide quite a useful uh, tool to think about criminal responsibility or potential criminal responsibility of corporate officials. However, uh, how this is going to be applied in practice at the domestic level, at the level of the International Criminal Court remains to be seen. And I believe that Yerne will talk more exactly about the practical implementation of accountability mechanisms, perhaps not so much from criminal law perspective, but more from a practical uh, general international law framework. So with that, I will stop and I'm happy to go deeper with what, any of the points that I raised in this short presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Um... Now we're going to hear uh, from Yerne Czernic. Uh, Yerne is uh, Associate Professor of Human Rights at the Graduate School of Government and European Studies in Ljubljana and Kranje, Slovenia. He is Senior Research Associate at Global Law Initiatives for Sustainable Development in the UK, 
and senior research fellow at um, uh, University Institute of European Studies in Torino. Uh, he graduated from uh, uh, Ljubljana uh, with uh, uh, high awards. He completed his PhD in corporate responsibility for fundamental human rights in Aberdeen. He holds a diploma in human rights law from EUI and a diploma in uh, uh, comparative human rights law uh, from the Rene Cassin Institute uh, of, human, of International Human Rights. Um, he served on the management board of the European Union Fundamental Rights Agency. He's worked in the Superior Court of the Republic of Slovenia. He has worked at the ICC. He's worked at Aberdeen, Lund, New York University and EUI. Uh, and uh, he has published in many languages, published in Slovenian, English, Italian, Romanian, Spanish, and Swedish. So uh, we have um, another uh, esteemed uh, scholar who is going to present to us now. Thank you, your name. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Richard. Uh, good evening, uh, good morning uh, here from uh, Ljubljana. It's a pleasure to participate at uh, this uh, conference on business and uh, human rights at uh, USA LA. Well, my, my paper today, my talk today will be addressing uh, the future of human rights, so the future of business human rights. My paper deals uh, with uh, normative proposals and potential models for enforcement of the uh, potential UN Treaty on Business and Human Rights. And I will um, address this uh, in, uh, in four ways. I will uh, propose uh, four different models for enforcement of this treaty if, if uh, it will be adopted in a, in a near or short term future at the uh, United Nations. Many of you, many of you know that uh, business and human rights uh, suffers from lack of uh, accountability for business related uh, human rights abuses, lack of accountability, both at uh, state and corporate uh, levels. Uh, victims, rights holders often have diff difficulties bringing cases before domestic courts, regional courts, um, and of course also at, uh, before international courts. And those difficulties uh, have much to do with uh, general challenges in, uh, in human rights fields. Uh, many of the countries uh, lack uh, efficient uh, judicial systems. Uh, they don't have strong institutions. The rule of law is in many jurisdictions uh, uh, deficient. So many of the victims, rights holders, they have to look for avenues outside their countries in uh, the, uh, the states where corporations are, are based or before regional mechanisms. So it's uh, it's a challenge for victims and rights holders to bring, uh, to bring uh, cases against corporations uh, at, the, at, the, at the global level. Uh, as you know, UN guiding principles on business and human rights uh, in 2011 uh, imposed a framework of, uh, of uh, quasi-judicial, quasi-legal obligations on companies. Uh, some would say that there are recommendations, other claim they are uh, quasi quasi legal obligations which companies and states have to comply uh, with but some of you you may know that uh, after the adoption this year and guiding principles there was a quite uh, uh, raised uh, discontent among the civil society both at domestic and domestic and international levels uh, with the uh, lack of uh, teeth of the UNGPs that uh, civil society organizations were arguing that UNGPs do not provide uh, effective access to remedy for, for the victims. And following to that, uh, some countries uh, from global south proposed this idea of a uh, uh, UN uh, treaty, UN convention on business and, and human rights. And within the United Nations in Geneva, some states have been working on this proposal since, uh, since, since uh, six, seven six, seven years, uh, just the last October, the sixth session of negotiations concluded uh, on the second version of the draft of the UN, uh, potential UN uh, treaty on business and, and, uh, and, 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 and human rights. Uh, 
that treaty is still based on, uh, on, the, on the framework of state responsibility, state obligations. The draft does not uh, recognize that companies would have direct obligations under uh, international law, international human, uh, human rights uh, law. Still, the states would be the ones who would uh, have to implement the treaties in, in the domestic uh, uh, arena. One of the challenges of this treaty, uh, which I also addressed in the paper, have been uh, you know, the, the division. Again, uh, we have seen uh, as so often the last decades after the Second World Division between the Global North and Global South countries, uh, Global North countries almost do not participate in negotiations with some exceptions, of course. Uh, mostly states from Global South are negotiating uh, uh, this treaty. Uh, so the treaty as it stands, the draft as it stands, provides uh, for states to, to, to uh, you know, ensure corporate uh, and civil liability within their domestic spheres. But one of the areas uh, I'm thinking and addressing, considering this paper, is uh, how to make this uh, uh, treaty if ever adopted operation, you know, how to enforce it, how to make it a viable option for rights holders, for victims to to enforce uh, either state uh, responsibility or corporate uh, res responsibility for business-related human rights uh, abuses. Just to update you in this regard, uh, the current draft, the second draft of the, of the treaty does not provide for uh, an avenue for victims to bring cases uh, before any kind of mechanisms. No, it just uh, talks about uh, a committee, a UN committee, which would, you know, supervise the state reports, which states would have to submit every uh, every four or five uh, years. This is quite a change since um, the zero draft on the on the potential business university, which in its optional in its uh, optional protocol draft uh, envisaged. You no, know, it proposed uh, an enforcement mechanism where. Uh, whereby the victims uh, or rights holders would have an av avenue to, to bring cases uh, before uh, national implementation mechanism. So the protocol named uh, or called the, the enforcement mechanism at the, the domestic level. In a way, uh, those of you who are familiar with business and human rights, uh, it was a, uh, more or less a, a copy paste from the, from the implementation mechanisms, uh, mechanism under the OECD guidance for multinational enterprises, which provides for a alternative dispute uh, resolution, uh, offering good offices between uh, complainants and, and, and the company in order to reach uh, an agreement. Uh, at the end, it, it, it was not uh, a mechanism of uh, judicial uh, nature envisaged. So in my paper, I, I, I consider these options and I look into the future of business and human, human rights Perhaps some of you would say that um, uh, a bit utopian, uh, 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 considering this uh, at this stage, which, where it's not very center certain that uh, the treaty will be adopted um, uh, in the near future. But nonetheless, I think it's necessary to talk about the options for the enforcement, uh, enforcement especially now uh, since we are seeing really uh, important initiatives in the European Union for binding uh, due diligence regulations. So it's a, it's a, it's a complementary exercise, uh, which I uh, do in my paper. So basically I propose uh, four different models and I call them uh, judicial model, uh, crisis judicial model, and then two uh, administrative models. And uh, let me just briefly talk about the judicial, uh, judicial model. Ju judicial model would be a model which uh, we uh, it's a bit familiar from the practice of the European Court of Human Rights, from perhaps the, base, the best story of uh, human rights enforcement at the regional level, where uh, a judicial court uh, would consider complaints against the states for business related uh, uh, human rights uh, abuses, and then the judgments would be binding. The states would have to incorporate and execute them in the, in the domestic, uh, uh, in domestic uh, spheres. Uh, then secondly, secondly, I, I talk about uh, a quasi-judicial model where I propose uh, a model based on a traditional UN enforcement uh, model uh, 
uh, under human rights treaties, uh, and I talk about a model which could, uh, you know, uh, repeat uh, the the optional protocol to the ICCPR uh, under uh, Human Rights Committee, where where rights holders have an option to to uh, to send individual communications for alleged violations of ICCPR to the to the Human Rights Committee, and Human Rights Committee has a power to to deliver recommendations. Uh, recommendations at the end. Of course, the disadvantage of this model is that recommendations are not really binding in its entirety, and uh, the the committee has a lot of problems of uh, with executing uh, the recommendations, the views in the domestic uh, domestic uh, spheres. Then, thirdly, I propose a model based on uh, uh, ombudsman uh, mechanism of the of the International Financial Corporation. It's a ombudsman compliance mechanism uh, uh, based uh, uh, with international cooperation, uh, financial cooperation, which proposes, uh, you know, uh, alternative resolution me uh, mechanism in a case of um, failings or disrespect for human rights in the project finance, uh, in the projects uh, which are uh, financed uh, by international financial institution, and here. Here, uh, here again, uh, there is a there is a model of alternative dispute resolution uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, of course, there are advantages and disadvantages of this approach. It's not really a judicial or quasi judicial model, but in a way, it would be perhaps easier for for states to accept such model uh, as it would not, you know, uh, demand from them to to execute uh, directly the decision of this model in the in the domestic uh, spheres. And then uh, fourthly, I follow up on the model which was already proposed two years ago by intergovernmental uh, working group on uh, the treatment of business human rights, which is basically the model of the OECD guidelines and national contact points, where uh, states would be, states would, which ratify the treaty would uh, be obliged to establish the uh, uh, national supervising mechanism uh, in a way, national contact points under the OECD uh, guidelines, where, this, where the, the contact points would then consider, you know, both uh, uh, both the complaints submitted by the rights holders and then uh, also a response by the corporations in, in order to reach an agreement uh, at the end. All these four, uh, four models, which are in detail discussed in my in my draft paper, um, have these advantages and disadvantages, of course. Here the question is which strategy uh, should uh, neg negotiating states uh, employ, given the certain, uh, uh, cer given the the, the 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 balance of power nowadays in international community. Perhaps uh, the first judicial model of European Court of uh, European Court of Human Rights uh, is uh, perhaps too optimistic at this stage. Because in a way it goes along the proposal which uh, Manfred Nowak and Martin Schein already proposed uh, in the form of work court to human rights. Perhaps uh, at this stage is a utopian idea. Then the second mo model of UN, uh, UN uh, human rights uh, treaty, perhaps it's perhaps more viable than the first model, but still the states would have to accept individual communications uh, uh, for alleged uh, violations of this uh, treaty, we uh, we know that uh, even at the moment, no, not all member states of ICCPR are also also ratified the, the optional protocol under the ICCPR. So some states would not, perhaps not be uh, able to uh, or uh, would not wish to ratify that. And the third and the fourth model, of course, they are not judicial models. Uh, rights holders, victims would not be. Uh, content with uh, those uh, uh, non-judicial administrative models because it's very difficult for for uh, for an uh, ombudsman mechanism under the uh, IPC or uh, national supervisor me mechanism to provide justice for the victims. But nonetheless, uh, OECD gu guidelines and national contact points are one of the best enforcement mechanisms with all of its shortcomings, which now exists uh, uh, in a, in a business in human rights. So all, all, overall, uh, my paper looks into the future of business in human rights and tries to think of the 
tries to discuss the option which which uh, negotiating states have uh, have at the disposal and try it try it will also try to give some ideas to the to the experts sitting in the intergovernmental working group on business human rights uh, when they reconvene on at the se uh, seventh uh, session on, uh, of the negotiations uh, of the treaty uh, of the eventual treaty on business and human rights thank you Thank you, Yerne. Uh, uh, also, a very, very interesting paper. Both of these papers are um, uh, very, very good and uh, uh, very, very, very interesting. I think I want, I want to start with a question actually for both speakers. And, and I think the way I will do this is um, ask a question that's directed to both speakers uh, uh, and then ask questions particular to Yerne and uh, then questions particular to, to uh, Marina's paper. So the question that I have for both speakers is, is what do you think would be the most effective way of sanctioning or, or halting uh, human rights violations by corporations? Um, we can see um, pursuing some sort of uh, action or activity against uh, corporations or against corporate personnel. And Marina, of course, focuses because she's looking at the International Criminal Court, uh, which um, uh, focuses on individual criminal responsibility. Uh, Marina's paper focuses on going after the individual. Um, uh, uh, Yerne's paper would, um, and, and the uh, UN Business and Human Rights Treaty would appear to be focused on pursuing the corporation. So, um, uh, though pr presumably individuals as well. So the first dimension of the, of, of the question of effectiveness is, should we go after the individuals or the corporation or both? The second is what kind of sanction is likely to be most effective and um, most feasible, uh, monetary sanctions or criminal sanctions. And third, by what vehicle? Uh, we could imagine the UN treaty, we could imagine government sanctions, we could imagine uh, tort, a private right of action of some sort, we can imagine uh, you know, consumer boycotts, social labeling. We have a whole menu of possibilities. Um, and I'd like each of you to address that general question and why you believe that the means uh, associated with uh, the uh, vehicles in each of your papers would be effective. Um, uh, why don't I ask that question first and then go to particular questions um, for Yerne and then particular questions for Marina. Okay. So Marina, do you want to uh, take, uh, take, uh, take a stab at that? Yeah, thank you. It's a good question with a lot of angles. Um, my answer would be coming from my field of expertise, which would be criminal law. So why I think um, the tools of international criminal law are relevant. There are two elements there, mm, reputational and the actual result. So with respect to actual result, and I noticed both me and your name were using words like utopian or idealistic, is it possible to really hold, in this case, individuals accountable? We don't know. We don't know what the ICC decides with respect to communication filed by the ECCHR in Berlin. So we don't really know whether they would take it upon themselves at this point in time. However, as we also discussed yesterday, there is a huge reputational risk for companies. And in fact, they depend on reputation much more than uh, politicians or military leaders in a sense of deriving profit. Yes, politicians and military leaders have their own um, relationship with reputation, but with respect to companies, this naming and shaming is very, very important. And just the mere fact of having criminal proceedings instituted, even at this early stage against companies or individuals in companies, may have certain deterrent effect. Now, 
The deterrent effect of international criminal law is absolutely a topic of its own, whether it does or does not have the deterrent effect. However, there have been some studies that by merely joining the Rome Statute of the ICC, there has been some deterrent effect in many countries. So it's not clear whether prosecutions by the ICC as such lead to deterrence, but being part of this framework does. And uh, being part of the campaign uh, or being part of the claim that is filed in the context of the International Criminal Court or other um, international courts would actually lead to certain deterrent effect or ripples, so to speak, that go uh, to other um, domains and to individuals and companies. Just the mere fact that there is a possibility that you may stand prosecution. Uh, other vehicles, alien tort statute, uh, as well, it's a different vehicle, but also allows for similar type uh, responsibility. Now, whether it's a question of uh, specific uh, targeted prosecutions of individuals or companies, or whether it's a question of broader human rights compliance and broader mechanisms, uh, like the one Yurene was talking about, that I would probably leave to your Nate to answer whether he thinks it's a more targeted, uh, whether a more targeted approach is useful or whether we need a more general uh, framework. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the questions um, and comments. Uh, well, in business human rights, uh, it says, uh, it's, for victims, it's, uh, it's very difficult to bring a, a case against corporations or any, any duty holder you know, for for human rights uh, abuses, so they have to be very pragmatic you know, when they choose the avenue and the actor which they want to go against and bring the, the claim uh, against. Uh, so, of course, one, one should always consider all three avenues of responsibility, uh, either individual, corporate or, or state, state uh, responsibility. But of course, I mean, to, to ensure a, added value of uh, business human rights, perhaps the best way would be to focus on prevention, no? on on, uh, on the growing uh, uh, mandatory due diligence laws uh, which are being adopted around the world, particularly in the member states of the European uh, Union, and perhaps uh, also argue for you no know, supervision of this mandatory due diligence access to remedy, perhaps in a way as the French due diligence uh, uh, law uh, allows for courts to consider complaints for alleged violations of uh, mandatory due diligence for the largest French uh, French uh, uh, corporations. Uh, what kind of sanctions? You know, of course, the uh, the co companies would be the most uh, you no know, damaged uh, if uh, if uh, a fine would be imposed against against them. Um, and uh, there are some good practices. Uh, examples from around the world. Uh, uh, you're aware of the case from the from a U.S. administration a couple of years ago, where Chiquita, Chiquita Corporation was uh, uh, fined in uh, seven uh, or even eight figures uh, numbers by U.S. administration for violating uh, U.S. laws for uh, being complicit with uh, rebel groups uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in 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 Colombia. So one has to be really pragmatic when. Uh, talking about uh, ensuring credibility for business uh, related human rights violations, for sure, one has to start the domestic sphere you know, in the domestic courts. Uh, and we have seen in the last two weeks, two to three weeks, two important decisions by uh, by the Dutch, by Dutch and English courts uh, concerning concerning uh, liability in the large corporate groups and the relationship between the uh, headquarters corporation and subsidiaries. Uh, and this is the way to go. Uh, I myself, I'm quite reserved uh, uh, to put all the focus on regional, international, and international mechanisms uh, uh, because they're proven they don't they don't really work. Apart from the European Court of Human Human Rights, uh, the best way would be just to to focus on the improvement of the rule of law and institutions, both in the countries of global north and global south, so the rights holders have access to a, a proper mechanism which can ensure fairness and independence of, of uh, its proceedings. <laughs>
All right, th thank you, thank you, uh, Yarni. Um, so uh, let me now pose questions particular to each of the papers. Um, the first for, for Yerne, um, the, and I really have just two sets of questions. The first is why only these four models, right? Um, none of them seem very satisfactory in the end, right? The national supervisory mechanism is at best fact finding and recommendations. The World Bank IFC Ombudsman model has no binding decisions, no remedies, and no enforcement. It's essentially mediation. Uh, the UN Human Rights Committee model has no enforcement. Its decisions aren't even uh, legally binding in most circumstances. And even the ECHR model, which is, um, I, I agree with your, your statement in the last um, intervention, that it is, uh, somewhat effective, right? But even that model often is no means of sanction or enforcement for non-implementation of judgments. And so, you know, we have, uh, you know, an, uh, Orban in Hungary, we have Poland's um, Morawiecki, we even have uh, Slovenia's Jansa, right? So um, uh, given that those, all four models have serious limitations, should we be considering uh, uh, another process or, or model entirely, uh, maybe even outside of the human rights world? Uh, I'm thinking of, you know, something with decentralized enforcement mechanisms. Uh, you know, I, ideally we want something that's legally binding, determinative, and enforceable. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, one, one can imagine all sorts of things, an agreement uh, that a country must apply trade sanctions against another government if, if that government has jurisdiction and doesn't sanction a corporation for human rights abuses. Uh, one can imagine um, uh, uh, a human rights agreement in the context of the World Trade Organization, right? Allowing that would, that would cover um, corporate uh, behavior as well as state behavior. Um, so uh, I, the first question is why not sort of expand out to those other models? Um, the second question is that you refer to human rights violations or violations of human dignity throughout the paper. The question is specifically which violations, which human rights, right? Given that um, there are very fundamental differences among states about what constitutes a human right. And it's, you know, as in some cases, as fundamental as, as, a, as, a, as a split in emphasis between civil and political rights and economic, social, and cultural rights. But it gets, and when we get into even more, more specific rights, there's even more contestation. Um, so, um, so, and so the question is not only which human rights, but who should make the decision about which human rights are, are, are at issue. Um, you know, there's also a north-south split, not just over economic, social, and cultural, but, you know, things like which economic, social, and cultural, right? So child labor, right? Well, what's, what, you know, um, uh, the right to collective bargaining, is that a human right? The right to a fair, fair wage, whatever that is, is that a human right? Uh, transgender rights in a uh, religious fundamentalist country, right? Um, so, and, 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 you know, different countries make different trade-offs between, uh, you know, and some of these, some of these rights between, you know, we hear, you know, arguments about, uh, you know, the, the, the trade-off between development and human rights, say in the case of child labor, right? So, which rights specifically are you are you thinking of, uh, uh, and, and are being discussed in the context of the uh, UN Business and Human Rights Treaty? Um, so, uh, while you're giving thought to that, um, I have some specific questions for for Marina. Um, so. The first, I have three sets of questions. The first is that um, there's a repeated reference in the paper to corporations knowingly facilitating or doing X, Y, or Z, 
Um, but shouldn't all those references be to corporate officials, not to corporations, right? Uh, again, it's individual criminal responsibility. And then we get into the question, you know, in, that, in, in, in this cluster of questions about which corporate officials, right? So very few are likely to be directly knowledgeable about facts on the ground. And, and, and those who are aware, if we, if we look at some other examples in international law, uh, international or transnational criminal law, uh, uh, if we look at uh, the, you know, um, models, the OECD corruption uh, 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 arrangement, for example, what, what we find in practice is that those who actually know what's going on and, and how, you know, where the corruption is taking place, and in this case, what the weapons are going to be used for, right, are not the senior people in the corporation. The, the, usually those facts are hidden from them, right? It's not in the interest of the salesman, if you will, to, to report to their superior uh, that, um, uh, you know, how, how a weapon is going to be used. Um, so if we're, if we're really down in the corporate chain to say, a, you know, a managing director of, you know, sales in Persian Gulf or something, right? Um, are those the persons most responsible? And related to that, um, you know, increasingly there is some suggestion uh, that um, the Office of the Prosecutor at the ICC should narrow, not broaden, the aperture for investigations and prosecutions for a whole host of reasons. So, you know, why, why would we broaden it to sort of mid-level corporate officials? So that's, that's sort of the first cluster of questions. The second cluster is, um, uh, as you point out in your paper, right, arms transfers are almost always made to governments that, uh, that have mixed motives that is legitimate national defense concerns and perhaps activities that uh, might entail human rights violations, right? So, you know, an arms sale to Saudi Arabia or UAE, yes, uh, some of those weapon, you know, weapons might be used in Yemen. Others might be used in a legitimate defensive action against Iran, right? Um, so, um, you know, what, what exactly is the line you would draw? Um, what's the threshold? Is the standard always that if there's any chance at all of weapons being used as a human rights violation, then the sale shouldn't be made? Um, uh, and, and, and if I were a corporation or, or the person, uh, you know, a lawyer or the general counsel, if there was criminal liability associated, I'd simply have the government that's buying the arms um, offer a promise in the in the in the sales contract that the weapons won't be used against civilians, um, and you know that should diminish uh, risk of criminal liability given the high standards uh, uh, there. Um, and along these lines, tell me why this analogy is is wrong. Um, should we have criminal liability for murder for the Glock Corporation salesman who sells Glocks to a gun store in a U.S. inner city where some of the Glocks are going to be sold to homeowners for self-defense and some uh, we know are going to be sold to gangsters who will likely murder, right? Um, we wouldn't, I don't think we would, uh, you know, it's just, um, uh, I don't think we would, it would be, it would, I don't think we would find the, this salesman um, uh, guilty of a criminal offense. Um, why is why is your proposal uh, different? Um, okay, and then third, um, I really want to push on this idea of state authorization. Yes, state authorization of an arms sale. I can understand that it is not de jure um, uh, uh, um, a, 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 a complete defense to, to the proposed crime, right? But isn't it really good evidence of 
uh, an ex ante calculation and conclusion that an arms sale was unlikely to violate human rights. And so strong evidence of no mens rea of the person engaged in, of, of the corporate officials engaged in the sale, right? Uh, there was, you know, the government did due diligence. Uh, they didn't, uh, they didn't think it was likely to be used in this manner. Uh, and, and, you know, reasonable, we're re all reasonable persons and we, we made this assessment ex ante. Um, so, um, all right, so it's those three clusters for Marina. Uh, since I asked Yerne first, this will give Marina a little time to um, uh, consider her response. And why don't we still, why don't we start with Yerne? Thanks, Richard. Uh, very good uh, comments, suggestion. Uh, those are also the questions I, I was uh, thinking of uh, when writing uh, this, uh, this paper. Let me start with the second, second question as to the terminology. Uh, which human rights? Uh, well, the answer depends uh, which mechanisms uh, are we referring to. Are, if there are mechanisms at international level, then the UN, uh, the draft on UN uh, Treaty on Business Human Rights, uh, the last draft uh, from 2020, talks about international rec internationally recognized human rights. It does not make any distinction within this uh, uh, term. One of the previous drafts uh, you will be uh, interested to hear made the distinction between the international human rights and international crimes, but that was omitted in the in the last uh, draft. So I'm referring to uh, internationally recognized human rights. Of course, that also depends uh, on the domestic system, on how the states incorporated their international commitments and obligations in the, in, in the domestic domestic uh, systems uh, that would differ uh, for, for sure concerning not only economic and social uh, and cultural rights, but also concerning some civil and political rights. Just think of that uh, death penalty, right to life, also the understanding of torture, what is torture, or right to fair, to fair uh, hearing. So th there might be some differences in that regard if uh, the enforcement mechanism at the end adopted would be that of uh, national implementation uh, mechanism. But uh, I hear your concern uh, when talking about recognized international human rights because the term itself is vague. I agree with that. Uh, and also the, the drafters of the, the draft uh, treaty, the last uh, draft, uh, they make a very strange uh, distinction in one of the paragraphs when they talk about uh, statute limitation, they say, that uh, statute of limitations should apply for, for all of human rights, but for some human rights, which uh, have a character of international crimes or crimes against the international community, there should not be, should not be any statutes of limitation, uh, referring to probably to international, international crimes. As to your uh, first question, you're right. I mean, there is no perfect uh, enforcement mechanism at domestic or regional or international level, and you're right, even perhaps the best enforcement mechanism at the regional level for human rights enforcement, European Court of Human Rights, has many difficulties. You know, it, has, it receives too many applications, particularly from Central and Eastern Europe, where the rule of law and uh, state institutions uh, and access to court are not as good as perhaps in, the nor in Northern Europe. Uh, but uh, with my choice of different models, I try to, you know, put forward different, uh, the models of different nature, you know, judicial model, non-judicial, quasi-judicial model, and then two, uh, two alternative dispute resolution models. I agree with you that uh, one could uh, include different models. Perhaps the most obvious choice, with the choice which I omitted is domestic judiciary, you know, domestic, dom uh, domestic, uh, uh, Course. But I take this uh, in my paper as, as a given as the Business and Human Rights Treaty really imposes obligations on, on states to enforce criminal and civil uh, liability of corporations and before the domestic court. So those four models I'm referring to and proposing, they complement the domestic judiciary. That's why uh, I didn't put that as a, as a fifth uh, or one of the proposals. But you're right, there are many different models. One could also include, for example, arbitration mechanism or investment dispute resolution 
No, there are some good practices from the last years where investment bodies also referred to to emerging human rights obligations of of companies, or even uh, even as you say, uh, sanctions mechanism. Uh, the EU, the Council of the EU, just recently, two months ago, adopted so-called um, uh, European Magnitsky law, the law which you are uh, very familiar in the US, which uh, gives a le legal basis to uh, to the Council of EU, which is the highest uh, decision-making body in the EU, to impose the sanctions uh, both on on individuals and also on legal persons, corporations, which which uh, come from the countries uh, or have been allegedly involved in, in uh, systematic human rights uh, uh, relations, preventing them to do business uh, uh, within the territory of uh, European Union. So there are different options of different nature. Of course, some of them are more rights holders friendly, others are more state friendly. And uh, it will be then for uh, for uh, drafters, for uh, uh, negotiations for states to decide which uh, uh, which model to take up. Uh, as as things stand at the moment, uh, a good choice would be you know any any model would be would be a, a fantastic uh, choice because uh, the the recent draft as I as I mentioned does not include a draft optional uh, protocol. So states states are very reserved you not know, to add additional enforcement. Uh, body they deleted this from a, a draft uh, from two years ago so any model would would work and states as uh, them being states for sure they they won't like uh, a model which would give rights holders a binding access to a binding mechanisms uh, which would uh, uh, impose accountability to uh, for, to states or, co or corporations so my take is if any model will be adopted in the next two or three years in the annex of the draft treaty would be a model perhaps based on uh, on the OECD guidelines or even you know even uh, lesser uh, enforcement model which uh, would not uh, demand much from states would not really you know, push them into corner uh, when dealing with uh, cases of alleged business-related uh, human rights abuses. Thank you. Thank you, Yarne. Um, Marina. Thank you. Um, while we were talking, I had another idea about uh, effective mechanisms, which probably relates more to your nice area of expertise. These are the master principles on extraterritorial obligations when it comes to uh, abuses of this kind. This is also a soft law instrument, but it holds hold some potential in my view with respect of imposing obligations on states which uh, may be state hosting corporations that are abusing uh, human rights abroad so imposing responsibilities on states that are hosts for corporations and then somehow creating this transnational network through this extraterritorial obligation mechanism it's just one idea uh, i haven't studied it in depth but it just came to my mind so, um, with respect to questions directed to me, um, very interesting aspects. Absolutely, perhaps it would be more precise to use corporate officials as opposed to corporations in the paper, because indeed, international criminal does not hold corporations accountable. There was a proposal during the drafting of the Rome Statute, filed by France, to hold corporations accountable, but that was not accepted. In some uh, domestic jurisdictions, actually, uh, the law of attribution works the way uh, that actions of certain corporate officials are attributed to the corporation. So perhaps that is why I intuitively use them interchangeably, because this is actually the most common way to attribute responsibility to a corporation in domestic law where it's possible. Now, with respect to the level of corporate officials, I would probably disagree with you. Uh, I would say that CFOs and CEOs are probably the most responsible because they do actually, they are aware of the general operations of the company and they are the ones making executive decisions. So the executive decisions on uh, supplies are ultimately made by CEOs, CFOs, so higher level management and the lower level management in my understanding executes the higher level decisions. 
So we can speak about the precision of knowledge. I guess that is the core of your question. Like how, how much do they know, the CFOs and COs, uh, compared to those who actually execute their general guidance? And for instance, with respect to arms supplies um, to Saudi Arabia, there has been in 2016, uh, I believe it's resolution by the EU parliament calling for a EU-wide ban on supplies of weapons to, um, to Saudi Arabia. And it was uh, quite clear to all CFOs, CEOs, that this is the situation that crimes are being committed with the weapons supplied by European companies. So it was at the EU level, it was discussed at the EU level. And there have been many civil society actions protesting in front of these uh, corporations. Uh, there is a lot of civil society information uh, available in this uh, respect. So I would say that the knowledge is there. Uh, the specificity of knowledge, I would say it's the willful blindness criteria that we may use, like how much do I want to know in depth, but the general idea is there on the table. And I'm using just this example because I know more about it, but I'm sure the situation is comparable in other instances when COOs, CFOs are responsible. And my understanding, these are the people that are actually targeted at this point. So actually higher level management, not mid-level uh, management. And I would say that is the right way to, to proceed in this case. So the more responsibility you have, the, the more, um, yeah, the more chances to face this kind of consequences. The same as with military commanders, the same as with politicians. It makes sense. Um, with respect to the standard, the minimus contribution, this is something that a lot of international criminal law scholars are working with. For instance, William Shabazz wrote about it. How far can we go with uh, this uh, de minimus contribution? So if I buy diamonds, which are perhaps blood diamonds, if I buy a diamond ring and I don't check where it comes from, can I be held responsible? This is a similar example. Uh, on the other hand, on, uh, on, the, on the side of the consumer. I would say that it goes back to the question of balancing mens rea and actus reas. So uh, we have two elements, two aspects of complicity. That is what you know, how much do you want to contribute, and then what you do. So they work together, they're not separate. So if I know enough and I have intent to extract profit, Whatever I do is colored by that. So we have to look at it. We have to look at both elements. We can't look at one element and build a theory on it. So with respect to corporate facilitation, corporate complicity, what makes it culpable is the level of knowledge. And you raise this issue. It's, it is an issue. How much do they know? And then the intent to still extract profit, knowing that uh, this is what's happening. And then also, yes, the effect of their assistance on the crimes, assistance on the crimes, which is actus reus, and it's weaker, exactly, it's weaker with corporate facilitation compared to other types of complicity in, in war committed by the military. So I would argue in this case, the responsibility lies on the company to discern uh, where their uh, supplies go, but they have limited capacity to control that. So. Um, my understanding that certain assurances are indeed obtained from uh, the receiving states. It's a very opaque area with respect to arms trade, so there is not much known publicly. But my understanding that uh, countries do give certain assurances that the weapons will not be used for uh, violations. What is the value and weight and legal weight of these assurances? I don't know. I know that I attended the conference with uh, one of the officials from Department of State in one of the European countries. And she was saying, look, we are not responsible for whatever happens in Yemen because we asked the government of Saudi Arabia to give us assurances. They gave us assurances. We gave our authorization to the companies, the companies supply weapons. So it was at the level of the state officials, State Department, uh, Department of Defense. But I would say the same logic applies to the companies, even if they seek certain uh, assurances from the state which is receiving the supplies, it's not necessarily correlating to what happens later. So we can't really absolve companies of responsibility if they receive this uh, approval. Perhaps I'm being too radical, I'm just building a model here. So I'm very open to criticism and it helps me also to think through these issues. Um, 
the last point about authorizations. Uh, one part of the problem is that state authorizations are relevant to state-owned companies because a lot of companies in the area of weapons trade, again, are owned by the state. So in a sense, it's, a, it's one entity somehow quite linked. So the, um, the authorization um, given by the state may be also attributed to the company itself. So the company may say, well, we are connected with the state. The state has done due diligence and we don't need to do it because we are together. That's one part of it, a more specific one to arms trade. Um, Marina, um, if I could just interrupt you for one, for just a second, we have less than two minutes left and uh, uh, I wish we had a lot more time, but if you could quickly uh, get make the second point and then I, I'm afraid I need to wrap up. Yes, just a very quick second point, conscious choice to contribute, what it means to consciously contribute to a crime. Um, this is relevant for purpose requirements, so it's it's important that um, we need uh, so that we prove that the company decided to consciously contribute to to the crime, and the existence of prior approval by the state may uh, undermine this conscious choice argument that they did so. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. I really regret that we are. Um... Uh, out of time. Um, um, I'd like to end by just saying that I, I, both are really interesting subjects. And while you both have referenced at one point or another uh, this morning, the idea that, well, I realize it's idealistic or it's you know difficult. Um, I commend you. Uh, this is how uh, uh, new areas of international law develop. And um, uh, as uh, those of you who've studied the Rome, the history of the Rome statute, uh, which goes back decades, actually, and I see Richard Dicker is here and he was involved in the negotiation of the Rome statute. It's a long process and it takes people dreaming about how to construct these structures. And um, uh, I commend both of you for trying to uh, advance the ball on these fronts. So thank you both very much.